stop me from heaven, I've taken my stand. I live in the house he's prepared for all of us he spared. Praising his name and giving him back my love eternally. For if you lose your life for Jesus' sake, you'll find it. And if you save your life for this world's sake, you'll lose it. There's a cause to the cross, but it's worth the life you lose. So many souls are serving the All right, good morning. Welcome to Crossover Church of God. We are so glad you're here. I am uh, Pastor Chris. This is Crossover Church of God in Old Town Clovis. I say that for the benefit of those that are still watching from remote locations. We're so glad you're live streaming with us. We can't wait to see you in person. Um, Bless you. I encourage you, if you are watching remotely, turn your living room, wherever it is that you're watching, turn it into a sanctuary. Amen? Amen. Because the presence of the Lord, that's what it's all about. And he's here because we are gathered in his name, but he is also there with you. I know that a good portion of our church is still watching remotely, and bless you. Uh, Do you mind standing, please? We're going to open in prayer, but but first, I want to read a little bit from one of my favorite psalms. Of, Of course, it's from David. Psalm 103 says, Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, in other words, everything in me, everything that I have, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. See, he is speaking to himself. He's not schizophrenic. He's just exhorting, exhorting himself because we get distracted, don't we? We get depressed. We get anxious. We look around. He's telling himself, hey, focus on the Lord. Forget not all his benefits. Forget who... Remember who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Aren't you glad for that? It's never too late to enjoy a happy childhood. Amen? Amen. I like that. So uh, let's just pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this. We just thank you, God, because... um, Lord, no matter what kind of condition we came in here in, no matter where our minds are right now, we can choose. It's a choice, Lord, to push all that aside and to praise you, God, to bless you, Lord, the old version says. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. It's amazing to me that I can bless you with my worship, but it is. It blesses your heart, God. We bless you as you bless us. It's amazing. And, God, there surely is a lot of benefits, Lord, to being your child Thank you for forgiving us, Lord. Thank you for removing our sins so far as uh, away as the east is from the west. It's all you, God. You do the heavy lifting. And I pray right now, God, that as we, as we worship you, Lord God, let the worship connect with heaven, Father, so that heaven could visit with us. Your kingdom come today, Lord, through worship. God, you provide the fire. We'll provide the sacrifice. I love that song that says that, Lord. You provide the fire. We'll provide the sacrifice. And what is the sacrifice? It is the fruit of our lips. It is our heart that is rent towards you, Lord. 
It is our minds that are focused on you, Father. You are deserving of it all. Fill us up, Lord, as we worship you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Jesus. We thank you for that, Lord. And Father, we thank you for the prayers that went out yesterday for the Beat 5, which is the area that we are in, Lord God, this neighborhood that you've assigned us to, that you've positioned us in as a church. And Father, we continue to come in agreement and declare over our community that everyone can come to the cross. Father, we pray for them. We pray for those who are lost, who are hurting, hurting, who are broken. 
And out of that brokenness, Father God, are acting in violence or out of hate or out of stress or fear. And Father, we just speak life over them in Jesus' name. And we pray salvation to come forth in our community. And Father, we pray salvation over our households. In the name of Jesus, Father, we know that there is household salvation. And we speak life, Father God, to our lost ones who are away from you, God. Father, we pray that you remove the heart of stone and you give us a heart of flesh. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Lord. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place with streams of grace flow deep and wide where all the love I've ever felt comes like a flood comes
remember the cross. We remember the cross. Lord, even as our pastor prayed already this morning, oh God, that you forgive all of our sins and you heal all of our diseases, Lord, and you redeem our life from the pit. We remember, we remember Jesus. We are in awe of you. We remember your sacrifice. But Father, we come to you this morning on behalf of those who are sick and afflicted. Father, we want to thank you and praise you for sustaining and keeping our dear brother Richard. Father, we have not forgotten him, and we know you have not forgotten him. Father, we thank you for being with him, keeping him, sustaining him, healing him, blessing him. And Father, even now in this place, as we gather together in your name, we pray over every single person who is in need of physical healing, emotional, mental healing. Father, we declare that you have provided that for us by the stripes that were placed upon Jesus' back. We reach out to you, God, today to receive your gift of healing in the precious name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. 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 There's just something about
Father, we speak the name of Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus over the conflict in the Ukraine. We speak the name of Jesus over all the displaced people. We speak the name of Jesus over the orphans who are fleeing and needing to be taken to a safer place. We speak the name of Jesus over this hurricane disaster that came into Texas. We speak the name of Jesus over every disaster that's taking place in the world. All of those who are calling out upon the name of Jesus that you have promised to provide for them, Lord. You have promised to be with them, protect them, keep them, guide them, Lord. Provide for them. We thank you for it, Lord. We thank you that you are good, you are faithful, you are trustworthy. And we declare the sovereignty of God over this earth, Lord, over the nations of this earth. And we cry out for your outpouring of your Holy Spirit to every hungry heart. And we thank you for it in the precious name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. In that same key, brother, I believe you're in the key of C. There's another old one. I will come and bow down at your feet, Lord Jesus, in your presence, His fullness of joy. what you're looking for, Father. You're looking for a church that will come and bow down, Lord, either figuratively or even literally, Father, in your presence, who will revere your presence, who will understand that in your presence is fullness of joy, meaning that there's nothing else, Lord. There's no one, no relationship, no, no, uh, no sense of arrival in this world. Nothing compares to you, Lord. You are the answer, Father. And I believe, Father, that as we become that church that comes in with an attitude of worship, 
and a laser-sharp focus, Father, to see your name proclaimed in this place, Lord. God, that things will start to happen, and these pews will be filled up, God, because you just gave me a vision, Lord, as we were worshiping right there, God, that if we will keep it up, that if we will lift up your name in this place, you will draw all men to you. You will fill these pews, Father. It'll happen sooner than we think, Father, if we will just lay it all down, God, and come in and give you the honor and the glory that you are due, Father. But we need to humble ourselves in order to do that, God. That means we lay aside anything, God, that is tripping us up. That means we lay aside, God, the habits, the, the, the attitudes, the, 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 the mindsets, Father. Lay aside the disbelief. Lay aside, Father, the anxiety, the fears, anything, God, that would keep us back from you, Lord. They must be laid down, Lord, in order to become that church, God. Free us so that we can worship you, we pray in Jesus' name. Because there is nothing, there is no one who compares I want you to know I don't I don't talk much about visions and whatnot because you know the, the, the proof of a prophet you know people these days have business cards that call themselves prophets you know I'm always a little bit leery of that but you know what what does prophet mean what does prophetic mean that just simply means speaking the words of God and sometimes I believe he gives me things that I and I ask him is God is that for me or is that for the congregation and I just feel like I'm supposed to share that but as I was standing here a minute ago I sensed this place filled up, shoulder to shoulder, shoulder to shoulder. Amen. As we as we open our lips, the fruit of our lips, giving praise. Let the let the uh, alarms of praise explode from this place. The flame of revival as it breaks out, as people come in, open, open and willing and ready for what God has for us. Amen. I want to be a part of that. How about you? Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. I have message I believe is from the Lord today. I hope that it blesses you. I do want to thank Twyla for filling in last week. I know, man, there's one thing I know that when I give the pulpit to that woman of God, that that it is going to be good. And uh, thank you, Twyla. That was a powerful message last week. I hope that I can add to it today. Also, um, you noticed our situation with the parking Next week is Big Hat Days, just a little word of warning. <laughs> it's always a good thing. It's a great thing for, to be in Old Town Clovis. We don't, we don't uh, shy away from our location. We, it's at times a slight inconvenience, but we know that God's placed us here for over 100 years. The name of Jesus has been proclaimed in this building, and we will continue to. Uh, just know that next week the parking will be even, even a little bit more um, uh, tough. Maybe you might want to give yourself a few more minutes to get to church and then enjoy the festivities of Big Hat Days after church. So bless you guys. Let's open our usual way. Please open, uh, repeat after me on the screen. I open my heart to receive from the Word of God. God's promises are true and they are true for me. I heard recently on the news that we were entering another drought year here in the valley and I thought, oh great. You know, and uh, there's a sense of dread. We're, we all have experienced drought here in this region that we live in so often. We know the impact. We've all really become amateur hydrologists in a way because we understand the jargon. We understand the metrics, you know, the inches of rain and, and that. We understand snowpack and how that affects the, the runoff and all of that. We watch the weather. We look at uh, patterns, all of that. Uh, counting, counting on the rainfall, praying for the rainfall. I know I prayed for it. By the way, all that being said, we're it's supposed to rain tomorrow. That is why I have not washed my truck. <laughs> Literally all week I've been thinking, man, my truck is filthy, but it's supposed to rain tomorrow. So uh, thank you for those that have been praying for rain. Uh, it's going to happen tomorrow most likely, so praise God for that. And by the way, I also, I'm sorry, this is almost kind of off to the side. I'm not going to go off on a 
uh, rabbit trail, I promise. I just want to thank those that step up and have been stepping up. Lately, we have been going through some uh, discipleship uh, classes, and we've been going through some studies, and we've had leadership step up. We've had many sign up for those classes. It's so exciting to see that happening. That's a sign that God's at work. Uh, also, we've been having, we've been experiencing people volunteering for to help in different positions. We are experiencing that today. I want to publicly acknowledge Greg and Sherry. Thank you so much for stepping up back there on the sound and in the computer so that we can have layers. We like to have layers, that's for sure. So I was talking about rain a minute ago. I want to open your mind to something that you may, you may not have considered. Have you ever pondered the fact that rain is not created? Just leave it to me to come up with something like that, right? I mean, my, I've always been like that. Ever since I was a kid, I think of things, and I just analyze why, why, why. Did you know that snow is not created when it snows? When it rains and snows, it's not as if the weather conditions come together just right that rain and snow were just created out of nothing. Let me explain to you what I mean. I'm going to show you the water cycle here. Okay, this has now become a science class. I didn't know there would be science today, Pastor. That's all right. I'll probably work in some math and history, too. Who knows? But check this out. This is the water cycle. This is how it works. So it rains. It, it rains. Let's just, let's just look at it this way. It rains. It snows in the mountains. The precipitation, their surface runoff, it turns into groundwater that begins to evaporate. It goes up from the oceans and the lakes and the streams, becomes condensation, transpiration from plants, goes back into the atmosphere, comes back down as rain. You get what I'm saying? When God created the earth, he put a certain amount of water on it, he certain, put, a, put a certain amount of land on, and that's it. And that's what, what happens is, is that, so that, you know, when we go through a drought condition, that means the barometric pressure uh, is, is, is such that it's pressing, it's such a high pressure that the, the water, the, the condensation from the clouds doesn't come into our region because of that pressure. It goes elsewhere, and you can bank on it. Usually when we are having, experiencing uh, that, that drought conditions, there's other areas of the country that are experiencing rainy conditions. Case in point, 2017, very, very dry here, extremely dry. We had fires. That was the first year of the real big fires that when they started. Guess what was happening in Houston at that time? Flooding, right? See what I mean? And, and so what's the point in all of that? Well, here, I want to make two statements that's going to be the premise of my message today. Here's the first message, or here's the first point. Everything that has been created has already been created. Everything that, excuse me, will ever be created on this, in this existence, on this earth, everything that will ever be created has already been created. You think about it. Think about wood, you know. We, you know, we think about the history of man, you know, the tools and whatnot that we developed. They were very crude thousands of years ago. Okay, well, they, you know, they, even the Bible talks about the, the cedars of Lebanon. You know, they, there was a very hard, expensive wood, and they were cut down and shipped, and that's what they built the temple from and all of that. Okay, well, that still came from wood. Where does wood come from? Trees by plant, you know, the, the seeds dropping into the dirt, and the tree grows, okay? Didn't come out of outer space, right? It, it, it all, it, it's the earth, it's, it's, the, it's the earth replenishing itself. Seeds are planted, they grow into wood, a tree comes up, they cut it down, make a wagon out of it or whatever they made out of it. Let's talk about the Iron Age. Here's an old artist's rendition of the Iron Age. It was such an important part of our history of man, dating back to around 1200 B.C., that, that's how far it goes back that we learned that you can actually ore, you can uh, mine iron ore and learn the smelting process goes all the way back to those days where they learned that they could melt it down and, 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 and make it into tools. Okay, well, that's iron ore. Huh. Where did that come from? The earth. It didn't come from outer space. They didn't pray to it just suddenly appeared. God created it. It's part of the earth. And by the way, it's, that's it. It's just like oil. There's a certain amount of oil in the world, in the, in the earth, below the surface, and at some point in time, it's going to be gone. The earth, what is, whatever, everything that has been created has already been created, and everything that will be created has already been created. The second important point I want to make as a premise of today is this. 
It all belongs to God. It all belongs to God. We need to understand that in a culture that has shaken its fist at an unprecedented level at God and assuming that we have our own uh, smarts, we can figure things out. We know what's kind, you know, be kind, be all this stuff. They make it sound like that any idea of, of, of a God, of an of a intelligent being is, is just old news. It's just archaic. It's just yesterday, man. We, we're smarter than that now. We're better than that, right? That's the attitude that we live in today. But I want to tell you, it all belongs to God. Look what the Bible says about the matter. Psalm 24, 1, through 1 and 2 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. I'll say it like Max McLean. You know, I listen to Max McLean. I, that's what I do oftentimes on my way to work. I listen to the word through Max McLean to, in the Bible app. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. You know what I mean? You can, I'm just being facetious. But uh, for some reason, I get the impression that God sounds like Max McLean when I listen to it. <laughs> you know? I mean, if, it's, if he's going to have an accident, it might as well be something cool like that, right? But it's true. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Get that. The world and all who live in it, guess who lives in it? I do. Do you? Do you live in the world? All who live in it. For he's founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. He did that. John 1 and 3 says, through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Do you get what I'm saying? <laughs> so that statement I made it a minute ago is founded upon the word of God. That's in the Bible. Through him, all things were made. No, without him, nothing was made that has been made. I don't know how I could say it any plainer than that. God did it, and it's all his. He created it, and by the way, he also sustains it. Did you know that? We talk a lot about sustainable these days, don't we? That word gets used a lot. It's a buzzword these days. A few years ago, it was the word paradigm. That got overused, and now we, now we talk about things that are sustainable. Well, I got an idea. You know what? I think it's sustainable. What does that mean? That means it endures. There's nothing that endures like the word of God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't go out of style. He doesn't need to be adjusted and updated. Did you know God does not need a reboot? He sustains it. He created it and sustains it. Look what the psalmist said in Psalm 147. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. He does that. He does all of it. Now look at what Colossians 1 says. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him, and get this, for him. Did you get that? Did you know that we were created for him? The atheist was created for him. The world that is doing this at the idea of an intelligent creator was created for him. Hitler was created for him. Really? Yeah, it says all things. Everyone. Now, inner sin, and now we understand the picture, right? It was all created for him, by him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Did you know that? I, I, you don't have, I don't have time to go into all this, but there is a word in, in physics that just fascinates me. And it's called entropy. Now, you guys know, many of you know, some of you don't, that besides being a pastor, I'm also an engineer. So I get kind of nerd, I nerd out on things like this. So excuse me. Let, me, let me do my thing here for a moment. There's this word called entropy. And it is basically the study and a calculable force of energy that is required to hold matter in place because all it, it, it has been proven that matter wants to go into disarray. It's just the way it is. And so entropy is a calculable thing, and they use it a lot in, in science to, to understand that, that, hey, matter wants to, matter just wants to go into chaos, but it doesn't. Isn't that interesting? How can that be? Well, let's calculate it. You know, then we can figure out how much power there really is in an atom, and we can make a bomb, right? See what I mean? There's power 
but there's something that's holding it together. Why is that? Why can you put all that power with the potential energy inside a canister that's just literally sitting there just like it's a can of beans on a shelf doing nothing, but under the right conditions, you drop it out of a plane and a whole island blows up. You get what I'm saying? Something is holding it all together. What is it? Well, I just read about it. Didn't, I, didn't we just read it? He is before all things. In other words, he was here when we were, when we were created, and he'll be here when we're gone. And in him, all things hold together. Did you get that? Guys, it's all his. And what I read here, what I see here, is that just as surely as he created all that is seen, he created and sustains it in a way that lets us see his majesty. We're going through a study in the book of Romans now on Wednesday night. A few weeks ago, we looked at that in Romans 1 where it says that God put it in each one of us. A subconscious, in our subconscious, we know that there's a God. We have that planted in us, every one of us, atheists, those agnostics, anyone, science, uh, they all know that there's a God. I mean, even the, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, even, even the scientists that don't, uh, that don't acknowledge him, you know, Darwin, the, the, the authors of all these theories of, of, of natural selection and, and all of this, you know, the Big Bang Theory, all of that, Stephen Hawking's uh, in his subconscious, knows that there's a God. Do we acknowledge that? Do they acknowledge that? No. In fact, many spend their entire life trying to prove, really, that there's not. Why? Because of sin and rebellion. It happened back at the uh, Garden of Eve. When sin entered the world, that, that statement that Satan made is still now being said thousands of years later. Did God really say you see what I'm saying? And he does it now in just subtle ways. For in him, all things hold together. Martin Luther said it this way, God writes the gospel not in the Bible alone, but on trees and flowers and clouds and the stars. I like that. True. There's a reason why you can go to the beach and be energized. There's a reason why you go to the mountains and you feel some kind of spiritual connection. Why is that? Because you're just some kind of really spiritual person? No, it's because God put that in you. Einstein. Albert Einstein. You're not going to hear this in the science books. He said that anyone who is not lost in rapturous awe at the power and glory of the mind behind the universe is as good as a burnout candle. Einstein said that. Anybody know who this is? Carl Sagan. Billions and billions. He's that guy. Carl Sagan, he's an interesting guy. An American astronomer, astrophysicist, cosmologist. He theorized that the universe was created by happenstance and for no reason. That was one of the premises of his entire career. However, get this. At the same time, he worked on a large telescope project for the purpose of finding extraterrestrial life. When asked about his interest, he said, when we find out who they are, we will find out who we are. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? We are all searching. We are all searching. We have big questions. Every one of us, we need big answers. We need something that is bigger than we are. I'm here to tell somebody that that something is God himself. God is the answer. He's always been the answer, and he will always be the answer. He doesn't go out of style. He doesn't fluctuate with the interest rates. He holds it all together. It's not random. He holds the entire creation. Not one detail is missed. Not one. Very soon, I plan on continuing in my Nerd Out series where I'm going to talk about the axis of the earth, 24.5 degrees, and the, and the velocity in which it spins, and the circumference of the earth. If one of those details was off, we would either be flung into outer space or we would literally melt. Not one detail is missed. He, and get this, God moves it all around as he sees fit. Did you know that? Just like the water. The water is just redistributed. Do you get what I'm saying? When it rains, that means he's taking water from somewhere else and he put it over here. 
God does that. He didn't just come out of outer space. You get what I'm saying? Has anybody ever thought about rain that way, or am I just the only weird one? He moves it around as he sees fit. So what does that mean for us today? Pastor, I didn't know this was going to be a science class. Well, my point in all of this is God tells the clouds when to rain, and he tells your miracle when to arrive. You get what I'm saying? He tells it. We Don't give up. You don't give up praying for your unsaved loved ones. We're not going to give up praying for this city. We will see revival in this place. We will see this church filled up. We will see addictions laid down. We will see marriages restored. Do not give up. It's going to happen exactly the moment that God says it. Look at, look at what his, he says in his word. Isaiah 46 says it this way. I am bringing my righteousness near. It is not far away, and my salvation will not be delayed. Hallelujah. God said that. I didn't make that up. God said that. My salvation will not be delayed. His plan for you will not be delayed. Look what it says three chapters later. This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. In the day of salvation, I will help you. Did you get that? Did you know that that's in the Bible? What does that mean? When God says go, it's go time. That's exactly the note that I have in my Bible next to that verse right there. When God says go, it's go time. He just hasn't said go yet. Don't give up. You get what I'm saying? He's heard your prayer. He knows what you're facing. He knows the problem. He knows what our church has been been striving for and praying for. He knows we're hungry for revival. He knows we want to build this building addition into our grass so that we can get accessibility to this building for the first time since it was built over 100 years ago. People will get turned away at the stairs because of their hips and knees, and they can't handle it. We have tried over and over over the years to try to get things going on, and there's always some wall that we hit. And God has heard it all. He has heard our cry, just like he has heard the Israelites cry after hundreds of years in slavery. And he had a plan, and he said, it's go time. And he sent his prophet Moses. See, God knows the situation you're in. When he says go, it's go time. And here's another statement I want to make to you. God is about to do something awesome and mighty. He wants us to be positioned in belief and obedience. Are you positioned? For your breakthrough? What if, what if, what if we are the ones holding it all up? I'm just, I'm just throwing that out. I'm just throwing that out. What if? Because he says, hey, my, delay, my salvation, my, my plan for you, it, it won't be delayed unless it's by you. <laughs> I spent the last few weeks talking about how much, how important belief is. I'm not even going to rehash all that. Listen to my past sermons. He wants us in in position, and in order to be positioned, listen to this now. If you haven't listened to me yet, I'm not going to bore you with science anymore, I promise. But I got something important I want to tell you. In order to be positioned, we must stop listening to the voice of the enemy and start listening to the voice of the creator. You hear me? You're out of position. You are out of position if you're listening to the voice of the enemy. And that's why he's trying to keep you out of position. That's why he stirs up things in your marriage. That's why he's stirring up things in your at work and and causing you to worry and fear. I got an important thing to say. I just ask you, will you give me half an hour of your attention? I this may be something that, that you've been needing from the Lord today. We need to stop listening to the uh, the enemy and start listening to the creator. You see, our vision is clouded and our hearing is muffled. We need enlightenment. Check this out. Ephesians 1 says it this way. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you know, that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people, and his incomparably great power for those for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when, it, when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Who? That, that's going on in me? I don't feel that at all. Well, that's why you need enlightenment. That's why, what does that mean? I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. We're clouded, man. 
we got scales on our eyes. Why? Because the enemy's lying to us. We're not in position because we don't understand. And look at that. It says we have power. His incomparably great power for us who believe. The power is the same mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Think about every thing that you think is powerful in this world. Next week, I'm going to show you some statistics. I talked a little bit about today about entropy and atoms, and I'm going to talk to you next week about the power of an atom bomb. I want to tell you, whatever power you can come up with in your mind, whatever power we as mankind were able to conjure up, it is nothing compared to the power of raising somebody from the dead. Amen? There's no power. I mean, come on, man. Science, man, come on, bring your best. God, God, God would just look at them and patiently go, okay, well, now, now bring somebody back from the dead. Power. That word power that Paul used in the Greek is dunamis. Dunamis is what we get the word dynamite from. It means power, it means might, it means ability. The highest power ever. And notice it said, did you notice it said, for us who believe? Did you get that? There's power, and who's it for? Everyone? Okay, awesome, man. No, 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 it's for us who believe. Did you get that? Now do you understand the importance of belief? Okay, please hear me. Did you know that Satan knows the power of belief too? That's why he loves to plant not unbelief, misbelief, misapplied belief. That's a new phrase I'm going to introduce to you or a new term. See, here, here's, here's the premise, guys. Here's a thought. It is not the events in our lives that make us feel the way we do. I want to say that again. It is not the events in our lives, past, present, or future, that make us feel the way we do. It is what we tell ourselves about those events. It is what we believe about those events. Come on now, this is good. If you're making notes, this is noteworthy here. This is, a, this is a key. Somebody's going to get free today. The lie is going to be exposed today. I want to say it again. It is not the events in our lives that make us feel the way we do. Sorry, I should have made a slide about this, but it's all right. It's, I'll go slow. I'll let you ride it. It's not the events of our lives that make us feel the way we do. It is what we tell ourselves about those events. It is what we believe about them. What we believe determines how we feel and how we act. Right? What we believe determines how we feel and how we act. Now do you understand why the enemy wants to cloud your vision and foggy up your ears? Why is he speaking to you what he speaks? The enemy clouded our vision, so we need enlightenment in order to correct that belief. Amen. <laughs> Don't we? I mean, we have believed. Again, it's not, it, it's not the events. It's not what's happened to us. It's not what happens to us that gives us stress. It's how we react to what happens to us. It's always about our reaction. It's always about what we do with it. Stress is not only about what happens to us. It's about how we react to what happens to us. I can vouch for that because I can stand here before you and tell you that with no, with no hesitation, what used to send me off a cliff doesn't send me off a cliff anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? The fiery arrows, they still come. But you know what? God's building up my shield of faith in which I can extinguish them. Right? So the same events that happened that used to launch you into some kind of self-pity party or make you shut down or go into isolation or, or worse, catatonic almost. Don't do that anymore. You can look somebody in the eye and say, you know what, a year ago, two years ago, two months ago, if you would have said that, I would have just shut down, man. That would have just crushed me. But you know what, it's all right. It's okay. I love you. 
We learn boundaries. We learn how to say no. What a concept. See how it works? And, and, it, and when we have this mindset, when the enemy has us clouded, it, it turns into self-sabotage. Let me give you an example. This is just one example. You're going to go to a big social function. Maybe it's work-related. Maybe it's friend-related, whatever. And you're wringing your hands about it because you're thinking in your heart of hearts, you're thinking, wouldn't it be horrible if I go to this function and nobody talks to me? Nobody accepts me. I don't want to go there and be awkward. So that belief that that could happen turns into anxiety. You go to that party with a pit in your stomach. You're sick to your stomach almost. You talk yourself out of it. You probably arrive and walk up to the door, then go back out to your car, then walk back up to the door, then go back out to your car, and that's it. I'm not going. Oh, yeah, yeah. And all because of a belief system that was planted in your mind about what could happen. And then what happens is you go into that party. You finally get the bravery and the courage to go in. You're completely antisocial. You're just waiting for the shoe to drop. You're waiting for that person to look at you cross-eyed, and you're out of there. And you missed out on the very thing you were starving for to begin with. See how it turns into self-sabotage? It's craziness, really. And the enemy laughs the whole time. It started with a belief system, a thought. And we, our belief system leads to how we feel and how we act. You get what I'm saying? So whereas I just read that we have the power that raised Christ from the dead in us as believers, but yet it's for those who believe. You get what I'm saying? The church is the walking wounded. You want to talk about potential energy, we are literally walking around literally with more power than the atom bomb inside of us at any given moment, and we are just fodder. We are just like a ping pong ball in the paddle of life. Man, pa, pa, we're all over the place. The enemy is having a field day because of what he gets us to believe and what we are rehearsing in our mind, cursing, nursing, and rehearsing. I can't do that. I can't, I always fail. I do this, I do that. People don't like me. I'm not likable. It turns into a belief. It starts as a belief, and now it becomes how we feel about ourselves, and then we just walk that right on out. You get what I'm saying? This is, this, is, this is deep. But we need enlightenment, guys, don't we? When we, are, when we are enlightened, when we start getting it, get this, oh, hallelujah, our belief and our obedience can trigger the same power, the same dunamis power that created the world by speaking into existence. That's another thing science hasn't done yet is just speak something into existence. Hey, let's get together and make a whatever. I don't know, okay. Get your own materials. Get your own dirt that you're going to plant to grow that tree to carve into that wood. You know what I mean? The same God that did all of that by speaking it into existence, we have our belief and our obedience, our being positioned correctly can trigger that same power, the same power that flung the stars into space, the same power that created man in his own image, by forming us out of dust, the same power that breathes life into our nostrils, the same power that pushed back the Red Sea, the same power that turned back the, the Jordan River at flood stage, the same power that brought Lazarus back to life, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave is about to bring some dead things to life in our lives. Hallelujah. That power is available to us when we believe. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> This is good stuff here. I'm sorry. I'm not bragging on myself. This is the Holy Spirit gave me this. God has something to say today. I'm just a humble servant trying to be humble, trying to deliver to you a powerful message that God gave me, and I hope I get it too. We are his, guys. He created us, and he sustains us. Oh, God, enlighten us to the truth. Can we all say this nice and loud? Those at home, say it on your TV screen together. God, enlighten me to the truth. God, enlighten me to the truth. In other words, I want to get it, Lord. I want to understand, Lord. I want to have my eyes open. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. I'll say it again. Somebody in this church needs to hear me say this again. God tells the clouds when to rain, and he tells your miracle when to arrive. 
He'll say go time when it's go time. Maybe, just maybe, he's waiting for you. I'm just saying. But we must believe. <clears throat> That's the point. Now, notice what I just showed you in Ephesians. <clears throat> notice the words prior to the word power. You get that? Incomparably great. Did you see that? Incomparably. In other words, there's nothing that compares to this. Think about something that's powerful. We can't even imagine really, truly what incomparably great means because it's all relative to us. I ask you what's powerful. I ask you what's powerful. You guys are going to tell me something different. Oh, power of love, the power of whatever. In the Greek, the word used there is a funny word, herper, hooper, ballo, which is where we get our word hyperbole from. Anybody heard that word hyperbole? Exaggeration to prove a point. Excess, throwing beyond. It's hyperbole. It means to go above and beyond, far beyond. You get what I'm saying? That's the kind of power that we have. His incomparably great power, above and beyond anything you could hope or imagine. In fact, look at what he says uh, in chapter 3 of Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his great power, and I even put it in there, dunamis, because if you look it up in Greek, that's the word there. That is at work within us. Really? How's it doing? How are we doing on that? How does our lives display that? Well, it's how it should be. Look at that. Immeasurably more. That's that hyperbolo. That's a hard word to pronounce. Hyperbole, going beyond, exaggeration, excess. He's able to do that. Immeasurably more, far beyond, in excess of. Guys, the Holy Spirit is here today to enlighten someone that he's got it. He has your problem. He already has a solution. He is the solution. And get this, the one who holds the universe is holding your heart right now. The one that holds it all together, and guess what? He's holding your heart right now. He's got you. You're right where he has you, and now he's tugging on it. You feel him tugging on it? Hallelujah. He wants us to get it. He is fully aware of what we are facing. He is aware of our struggles. He is aware of our concerns. He is aware of our uh, of what we are facing and what we desire. And I want you to know that he has your breakthrough waiting for you, immeasurably more, far beyond what we could ask or imagine. He just asked us to step out in faith, to come to him, to cast it all on him, to walk with him into that miracle. You get what I'm saying? And of course, I said earlier, the enemy believes in the importance of belief. He has a message for you too. He wants to enlighten you too, doesn't he? Oh, boy, does he. God says, step out. The enemy says, shrink back, right? God says, dream big. The enemy says, give up. God says, I'm giving you the power. The enemy says, you don't have the power to tie your own shoelaces, right? God says, I'm restoring passion in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The enemy says, just roll over and play dead, lick your wounds and blame somebody else for your, the mess in your life. Right? Two different messages. Church, it's time for our awareness to start lining up with the truth. So, check this out. Belief happens when our awareness aligns with the truth. What does that mean? Because I've been hitting this idea of belief and obedience. Well, the obedience part we can kind of get because, okay, I need to obey. All right, well, that's something I can work on. But how do you just make yourself believe this? All right, I believe, I believe, I believe, Lord. Well, belief literally happens when our awareness aligns with the truth. What I mean by that. If you're taking notes, this is noteworthy. We need to start telling ourselves the truth until it sinks in and takes root. And then our awareness is our reality. And the truth is the reality. Let me say that again. We need to start telling ourselves the truth until it sinks in and takes root. 
It's counter to the message that we've been listening to for maybe decades. When are we just going to be able to rise up and say, get thee behind me, Satan? I'm serious. When that same thought comes up, which, which, by the way, it may have already happened during this message. It happens in church. You're worshiping the Lord, man. Part of you wants to just lift your hands. The other part is like, no, oh, I don't know. It never changes for me. I don't know. I don't want to be hypocritical. I've had a hard week. I don't know this whole thing. I don't know. <laughs> Get what I'm saying? Where do you think that message is coming from? God's not telling you that. Can you imagine God, Jesus saying that to you? Sitting right next to you going, you know, you really should give up. I mean, who are we kidding, man? Come on, come on seriously, really? No. <laughs> See, but when you start telling yourself the truth, it's counter to all that. And when the enemy speaks up, we can just say, shut up in the name of the Lord. We start telling ourselves the truth till it sinks in and begins to take root. Did you know that we crave what we eat? I can vouch for that. You know, I let sometimes I let myself go and I start eating hamburgers and whatever and all that. Well, guess what? That's what I crave. You know, and I just kind of do some exercise, some discipline, and stop eating that for a while, eat salads or whatever, or something more healthy, guess what I start craving? And it's the same way. What are you craving? Well, I Pastor, I don't understand, Lord. I, I, or Pastor, I don't understand. I, I just, uh, I don't know. I just can't get into that. I open up the Bible. It just, I don't know. It just seems like it's a bunch of words. It was written thousands of years ago. I don't know. It's like, well, you know what? There's an old phrase that I, it's not great theology, but I think it's, True to a certain extent. Why don't you fake it till you make it? You know, you, you start feeding on it. You start feeding on it. Jesus said to those that feed on me, feed on my truth, you will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for you will be, you will be filled. You feed on it for a while, even if it doesn't taste right, you still do it anyway, and then guess what? It becomes a habit. And what becomes a habit becomes what, you're, what you do, and what you do becomes your legacy. How about a legacy of excellence for the Lord? See, belief happens when our awareness aligns with the truth. That's what I'm saying here, guys. This is who we are. I just read that that same power that raised Christ from the dead is in us. But, man, we don't exude any of that power. Well, maybe I'm not a Christian. Maybe I need to go up to the altar and accept Christ again. Well, okay, well, if, that's, if that's true, there's nothing wrong with being sure. But how many times are we going to get resaved? See, the problem is, is that many of us have made Jesus our Savior, but not our Lord. He's supposed to be Lord of our thoughts, too. Did you know that? Am I making that up, or does the Bible say that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind? Does the Bible say that our weapons have divine nature to tear down strongholds and we take thought, every, every captive, every thought to whom? To Christ Jesus. That means you take that thought to your leader. You're out in the jungle and you come upon an enemy and you don't engage with that enemy. You say, hey, I'm taking you back to speak to my leader. Hey, failure, I'm taking you back to talk to Jesus. Hey, unlovable. I'm taking you back. Whatever lie the enemy has given you, you take that back to Jesus. That's how you take your thoughts captive. That's when we start aligning with the truth, and that's when we realize who we really are. The power that created the universe is at work in us. Hello. This, we are not what brokenness tells us we are. We are not stuck in defeat. We are not stuck in our past. We are not irrelevant. We are not uh, an afterthought. We are not without hope. We are not without power. We do matter. We do have purpose. We can change. We can grow. We can walk in wholeness. We can be victorious. And we will be victorious in the name of Jesus. Because why? Because of our sparkling personality? No, because we are his. <laughs> and we have that power in the name of Jesus. So let's personalize it nice and loud on the screen. I was made for this made for this, man. I was made for this. I was made for this. Come on now. Somebody needs to get it. I was made for this. You were made for this. Get behind me, Satan. I'm not buying that lie anymore. I am lovable. I am loved with an everlasting love. I am not a failure. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. 
I'm not going to be vict- uh, always failing because the Bible says I'm more than a conqueror. I'm not going to fail. There is no word fail anymore. I just found out a way not to do it. And, and all of a sudden now we start understanding these ideas that I am not what I do. Hello. I'm not what I do because if I am what I do, then when I fail, that means I'm a failure. It's impossible for me to be a failure if I'm in Christ because the Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So in other words, we're not identifying with our theories anymore. We're believing that these things that happen are just, that's what they are. They're just things that happen. I'm not going to believe that that's who I am anymore. See, it's all in the belief system. What we believe is how we feel and how we feel is how we act. We act in accordance with how we see ourselves. Ooh, man. I was made for this. God, I want to see. I want to see us get, I mean, I don't want to say cocky because that brings attention to ourselves. But how about confident? Confident, I was made for this. Man, I want to hear somebody scream that on that front porch when you go outside here in a minute. I was made for this, Clovis. I was made for this. I was made for victory. I was made for sobriety. I was made for victory. I was made for for, uh, a wholeness of mind. I wasn't made to be depressed. I wasn't made for anxiety. I wasn't made for worry. This is good stuff. This is our destiny. It's our birthright. It's our heritage. It's who we are. Am I making that up? Well, let me show you. Isaiah 54, one of my favorite chapters of Isaiah. See, it is I who created the blacksmith who fans the coals into flame and forges a weapon fit for its work. And it is I who created the destroyer to work havoc. Wow, that's a deep one there. No weapon forged against you will prevail. So God is saying, hey, I even created the devil. (laughs) He's on my leash. Hello? He's on my leash. I know it seems like the devil's winning. We live in a world where it seems like evil is winning, right? But I tell you what, I want want you to know, I've read the story. I know how it ends. God wins, and you're on God's team. Amen? So God is saying, hey, it is I that created the destroyer. No weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. Now get this. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. What does that mean? That means it's your birthright. It's who you are. I am free in the name of Jesus. This is who I am. I was made for this. Praise God. Man, we got to get some spiritual swagger in this place. Seriously, man, we'll walk out of here. No, I'm not suggesting you walk out of here and start looking for every demon under every rock. No, I'm saying when he does show his face, you just look at him right in the face and say, get thee behind me right now, Satan. I know the truth, and the truth is setting me free. Every time we choose truth over the lie, it sets you free just a little bit. You get what I'm saying? So God is here saying, because you're mine, no weapon forged against you will prevail. Because you're mine, you're going to refute every tongue that accuses you. This is who you are. We were made for more. We were made to thrive and not just survive. We were made for God-sized dreams. We were made for God-sized destinies. We were made for joy, for victory, for freedom. We were made for passion. Let's talk about passion in a minute. Where's the passion, by the way? Where's the passion, man? <laughs> I'm just saying, where's the passion? Is there passion in our lives? Have you lost passion in your life? All right, there's no condemnation. Look at what Nelson Mandela said about that. He said, there is no passion to be found playing small and settling for a life that is less than the one you are capable of living. I believe that. That's good. There's no passion in playing small. There's no passion in believing your beliefs that keep you, you're that guy or that gal that doesn't go to that party or you go to that party with so many knots in your stomach that you basically self-sabotage yourself and you walk out of there saying, saying see, nobody, I knew nobody loves me. When you were, it was because you were so socially awkward. You, you sat over there like, a, like one of those little uh, roly-poly bugs, right? And the people don't know what to do. You're so unapproachable. You have your, 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 your guard up. You, you hug people at arm's length. You never really let them in because if they let you, if you let them in, they know you. And if they really knew you, they'd reject you. So you put up this false front. You go through life with all this superficiality. People get tired of it, and they, and they walk away. Then you go, see, I knew they didn't love me. And the whole time you're starving yourself of the very thing that you were created for, relationship. And the most valuable one of them all is the relationship with your creator that is here to tell you, this is who you are. You are mine. I created you for passion. 
Let's talk about passion in a minute. Passion, the dictionary definition, is a very strong feeling about a person or a thing, an intense emotion, compelling and driving enthusiasm or desire for something, an intense drive or feeling of conviction. Ooh, there's a lot there. I like the driving and the moving. You get that? It's emotion. It's emotion. So passion can be thought of as emotion in motion. It's emotion in motion. It is an action that takes place when our awareness begins to align with the truth. In other words, we start getting it. When we start getting it, man, watch out. See, that's the way it's supposed to be. When we wake up in the morning, man, the devil should be saying, "Uh uh-oh, Chris is awake. Instead, he most of the time he says, oh, Chris, he's where I left him two weeks ago, man. All I did was bring up that past failure in his life. Man, he just... I just want to, I could go on and have some, some coffee, man. He's, he's good on his own. All I have to do is just plant that thought that people don't really love him. All I have to do is plant that thought that he really is not smart enough. He's not good enough. He's not pretty enough. Not good, not good, good looking enough. Whatever. And, I, and, you know, he takes over from there. I can go do something else, man. That's, but the way it's supposed to be is that it's emotion, emotion. We start getting it. We start really letting our beliefs change to how we feel about ourselves, and then we put it in action as we're walking in power, dudamous power, that same power that was exerted that raised Christ from the dead. Then, you know what? Bringing it all back home. Then what position are we in at that time? We're in position for that miracle. We are in position because God said earlier, in the day of my salvation, it'll happen. It won't delay it won't be delayed. His, his, his miracle is not going to be delayed in your life except by you, not by him. And I tell you what, man, we need to get in position because God is a God of movement. God is a God of improvement. He's a God of passion. He wants to restore your passion. He wants to take you into your breakthrough. Praise God for that. Okay, so I gave you the what. I gave you the so what. Now I'm going to give you the now what. Here's the now what. You've heard the truth, and now it's time to stand on the truth. Ephesians 6, 10 says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty dunamis power. That's that word dunamis again in Greek. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. 2 Corinthians, I just quoted it a minute ago. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power, dunamis, the same power that was exerted to raise Christ from the dead, to do what? To demolish strongholds. Our weapons have divine dunamis power. We are the ones that wield the power. We are the ones that wield the power. This is who we are. Did you know that Satan doesn't fear you? I don't think he does for a minute. What does he fear? Your power. Well, you better believe he fears your power. I can just hear him now. They're probably having a meeting about us right now. Hey, they're hearing about the power. We got to do something. All hands on deck. I got to start sowing doubt. So doubt shows up. Man, the, 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 the D's, man, they show up. Doubt. Oh, hey, man, no problem. I'll, I'll go to work. I'll sow some doubt. This isn't for you. No, this isn't. For, this is only for pastors. This isn't for you. You've tried too many times. I don't know. I just don't know. How about despair? That that means loss of hope. Okay, despair shows up. That's the second D. And there's a little quartet or whatever quintet. Doubt. Hey, doubt. I'm despair. I'll, I'll I'll join you because as soon as they lose doubt, then they're gonna lose hope. I mean, as soon as they start doubting, I mean, they're gonna lose hope, right? That's what despair is, right? Hey, hey discouragement. Don't forget me. I'm going to join the party. You guys can't go without me because once they've lost hope, now it's time for me to set in. I'm going to discourage them, man. Just lay down, man. Just shut up. It's all the way it is for you. And you know what that brings in? Depression. That's a setting, the perfect, cue. I mean, it's queued up, man, teed up for depression to come in. It's like a fog. You can hear the foghorn. Here it comes. Depression. And what is oppression? Among other things, depression is that thought, that strangling thought that says, this is just the way it is for you. Am I right or am I right? I mean, there's others. There's divisiveness. You know, there's, 
there's other D's, but man, that's a nice, that's a powerful quartet right there that he serves up. That's what he does when God's people start getting it. Those four D's, they show up, they go, hey, I'm your top, these are Satan's top men. That's his favorite tools that in his arsenal. Go doubt, go despair, go discouragement, go depression, go get them. The church is starting to get it. That's all we have. But you know what? We have divine power to demolish even those. Even those, as powerful as they are. Satan doesn't fear you. He fears your power. That's why he feeds you lies. So I've tried to make this very, very practical today. Let's end it with something practical. Let's, let's close by repeating five statements. Five. That's nice. Five. One, two, three, four, five. Serves a knuckle, makes up a knuckle sandwich. I'm going to give Satan five good reasons why he needs to get behind me, right? I call it the faith manifesto, right? What is manifesto? There's, another, there's a public direct declaration of my intent. This is a public declaration of policy. I got a new policy in my life. This is my manifesto, my faith manifesto. Ready? Here they are. It's in your notes. I am the one who wields power, not Satan. Say that. Say that however many times in a day you need to. Here's another one. I'm going to see a victory. <laughs> I give you permission to sing that song. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Why? Because the battle belongs to you, Lord. Amen. I'm going to see a victory. When you're doubting, I'm going to see a victory. When fear comes in, I'm going to see a victory. I am. And likewise, here's another one to say it nice and loud. I'm going to see my breakthrough. It's just around the corner. Now, nice and loud. That is the truth. That's the truth, right? We're fighting lies with truth. I said earlier, you got to start telling yourself the truth. That's the truth. And here's the last statement. I choose to believe this. It's a choice. It's a choice. It is. Amen? Is it practical? Did you get anything from today? And I just don't say that to feed my ego. I hope that you will do something with it because I believe we're on the cusp of something great, guys. There's a reason why God had something to say today. I hope that you that are still watching from home, I, got, I hope you got something from that. I can't wait to hear stories the testimonies that we're going to see when people start getting it. Amen? Just imagine when people start, God's people start getting it. These pews will be filled. I believe it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. What a powerful message, Lord. Deuteronomy's power, that is. I just pray, God, that you would just cause it to just ignite in our hearts, Lord. Like we said earlier, God, you provide the fire, we'll provide the sacrifice. We're sacrificing our defeatist thoughts, Lord. We're sacrificing doubt. We're sacrificing fear. We're going to put it all up there on that altar, God. I am done questioning you, Lord God. I am done doing things my own way, Father. I am done with my addictions. I am done with my uh, habits. I'm done with anything that is going to trip me up and cause me to get out of position because I can't wait to see the miracle you're going to do in my life, Lord. I say that for all of us, Father. I just pray, God, that you would ignite this church, Lord. Oh, that we would see the importance of watching what we're thinking, Lord, and watching what we're believing. We have the ability to change. We just found that out. We just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. Go in the name of the Lord. I'm